just trying to cover the protests outside. Well, at least they were. I was just trying to help them. September 1st, 2008, the first day of the Republican Convention. It's a beautiful blue sky day. And 10,000 people marched for peace. It was before the opening, the gaveling open of the convention, the McCain-Palin Convention. We'd just come from Denver. This wasn't a surprise to us. Mass numbers of people had protested the Democrats as well, calling for peace. And in both cases, delegates, some delegates were outside as well, and then went inside to be a part of the convention. So we covered the protest. I went to the convention floor, and my colleagues went to the TV studio to digitize tape. I was interviewing delegates from the hottest state, Alaska, and I get a call from our senior producer, Mike Burke. He says, come quickly. Nicole and Sharif have been bloodied and beaten by the police and arrested. And I said, what could you possibly be talking about? And he said, get there, 7th and Jackson. We race to 7th and Jackson. And Sharif is Sharif Abdelkudus, who you may all know if you listen to or watch Democracy Now! from his remarkably brave reporting in Egypt, covering the Arab Spring, covering the Egyptian Revolution. How many heard Sharif and Tahrir bringing us the reports of the people in the square, you know, you would meet through Sharif Adef Suef, the great Egyptian writer who wrote Map of Love. You would meet Nawal Sadawi, the 79-year-old feminist, former presidential candidate, imprisoned under Sadat, exiled under Mubarak, um, holding salons for young people before talk. We are still believing we will win as they were becoming increasingly dispirited. You met the girl in front of the state media building who was putting out a broadsheet. She was in high school in the shadow of the state media building that had spewed lies for so long. And there was Sharif broadcasting from Tahrir when the thugs brought down the satellites and the network anchors, like I remember Anderson Cooper in his hotel room with a lower third that said, reporting from an undisclosed location, looking a little like the old democracy now on Skype because the satellites were down. But our reporters, we've always used the internet from the beginning because necessity is the mother of invention and we couldn't always afford the satellites. And Hani Massoud, who is Sharif's partner in crime and covering the Egyptian revolution, Egyptian like Sharif. Sharif is the son of an illustrious family, his grandfather, the most famous writer of Egypt, Hassan Abdel Kudus. And Hani would video these interviews and leap over tall buildings in a single bound, jump over burning barricades, and get around the camels that were brought in to crush the people, race to, ha to Sharif's family's home, and digitize this tape, and send out 20 to 25 minute reports where you would meet the people of Tahrir. Sharif was then being interviewed by all of the networks. He also became the top, one of the top tweeters in the world. MSNBC, NBC, CNN were all calling on him all day, all night. We call that trickle up journalism. <laughs> but let's go back two years, to 2008, when I heard that Sharif and Nicole, Nicole Salazar, a multimedia producer, were arrested, raced to the corner of 7th and Jackson. And there was the riot police. They had surrounded the area. And I went up to them. I was wearing all the credentials, the top security credentials that you get from the police and the authorities that allow you to interview presidents and vice presidents and congress members. I just come from the convention floor. And I said, you can see I just come from the convention floor and I need to speak to a commanding officer because my colleagues, Sharif and Nicole, they've just been arrested. They have the same credentials I do. We need to have them released. It wasn't seconds before the police ripped me through the police line, twisted my arms back, slapped handcuffs on, threw me against a car, against a wall, onto the ground, charging me with a misdemeanor, uh, interfering with a peace officer. If only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. <laughs> I'm looking desperately still for Nicole and Sharif. I see Sharif across the parking lot. I demand to be brought to him. Finally, I am. I'm standing with him. He's also handcuffed. His arm is bleeding. We have our credentials on. We demand to be released, saying that you know we're journalists and the Secret Service ripped the credentials from our anchor necks. So I'm brought into a police van, and there um, they take me to the police garage where they've erected the cages to put the protesters in. But Nicole was in the van, her face bloodied. I said, what happened? And she said, well, we were in the TV studio. We heard a commotion outside. We got camera and microphone, raced downstairs. They wouldn't have been do doing their jobs if, if they hadn't gone downstairs. 
They saw some protesters, but then they saw the riot police coming fast at them. Nicole is against parked car as she is filming. She is holding up her press pass. The riot police are screaming, on your face, on your face. She's shouting back, press, press, and she didn't know what hit her. They came at her from behind and in front, and they took her down. First thing to go was her camera on the ground. It tumbled down, and they pulled the battery out of her camera. Um, they had their knee or boot in her back, and they were pulling on her legs, so they were dragging her face through the ground. She was, then Sharif came up and he told the riot police to come down. They took him and they kicked him up against the wall, kicked him twice in the chest and took him down, bloodying his arm. They faced PC felony riot charges. The video of our arrest went viral, most watched YouTube video of the first two days of the convention. And within a number of hours, I was released and then Sharif and Nicole were in to show the strength of grassroots activism. Thousands of people, after seeing the video, called into the Twin Cities police. They tweeted and they faxed in, they emailed in. And that's what freed us. That's what liberated us. Um, and Sharif was in a cell with the AP photographer. They arrested more than 40 reporters that week. But um, Sharif got out before the AP photographer. So I'm brought over to the convention center. It's all over now at night, but the networks want to talk to me about what happened. I'm in the NBC skybox and an interview is done and the NBC reporter comes over to me after and says, why wasn't I arrested? I said, were you covering the protests? And he said, no. And I said, well, I don't get arrested in the skybox either. <laughs> See, 90% of life is just showing up. You gotta get out there. The next day, Police Chief Harrington holds a news conference and to talk about the success of the operation, and I go to it, and the officer who opens the door for the news conference is my processing officer uh, from the night before. I said, you not only have to let me into this news conference, you have to let me out when it's done. And I go in and I raise my hand and I ask Chief Harrington, what have you instructed your police to do, and how do you expect us to operate in this atmosphere? He says we could embed, embed with a mobile field force. The police mobile field force. I saw a Fox reporter the next day with his Fox baseball cap in the middle of police organism move running down the street. No, embed, like reporters embedded with the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think the embedding process has brought the media to an all-time low. The Pentagon calls it a spectacular success, which is precisely why it's a complete failure. I mean, what are you gonna get when you're sleeping with the troops, eating with the troops, your life is in their hands. I'm not saying these reporters aren't incredibly brave. But you're reporting on the war for the trigger end. you got to get also the reporters in the Iraqi hospitals and Afghan communities and the peace movement around the world embedded to understand the full effects of war. And the idea that this flawed model of reporting is then being brought back to the United States and we're being told if we don't want to be arrested, we must embed with the police in the United States, covering what's supposed to be a celebration of democracy, a party convention leading to an election of the most powerful person on earth, the president, it's not acceptable. And so we sued the Twin City authorities and the Secret Service, and after a number of years, we have just won a six-figure settlement and agreement that the St. Paul Police will come up with a protocol on how they deal with journalists. And we held our announcement because we felt it's absolutely critical to send this message to police that they will have to pay a price for these illegal arrests, both of journalists and illegal arrests overall. Where would be the largest gathering of police who could hear this message? So we went over to Occupy Wall Street at Zuccotti Park, and there were hundreds of police, and they got the message. It is critical that we have an independent press. An independent press is what will save us. And so I want to end with a story about not only the police at home, but the U.S. military abroad. I want to end with the story of East Timor. How many of you know the story of East Timor? Your story. It is not a well-known story, not because people aren't intelligent and hungry for information, but because the media hardly covered the story. Indonesia invaded East Timor, let me tell you, in a nutshell. Indonesia invaded East Timor December 7, 1975. The day before the invasion, President Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger 
met with Suharto, the long-reigning dictator of Indonesia, in Jakarta, and they gave the go-ahead for the invasion. On December 7, 1975, as Kissinger and Ford flew out of Indonesia to meet with another leader, Marcos of the Philippines. The Indonesian military invaded East Timor by land, by air, and by sea, slaughtering thousands of Timorese, and over the next quarter of a century, killing a third of the Timorese population, one of the worst genocides of the 20th century. They closed the country to the outside world and just commenced the slaughter. 17 years after Indonesia invaded East Timor. In 1990, I got a chance to go to Timor with my colleague, Alan Mayer. And then we went in 1991, because for the first time, a UN delegation was going to go on a fact-finding mission to let the world know about what was happening in Timor. A third of the population killed. We've all heard of Pol Pot's Cambodia, because Pol Pot was an official enemy of the United States. And the President would say that, the Secretary of State would say that, and the media would dutifully report that. And I'm not saying it was wrong in that case. The media should have reported on Pol Pot's brutality. The difference, however, was that in the case of Indonesia, Indonesia was an ally of the United States, and it was a bipartisan affair. It started with President Ford, went on to President Carter, to Reagan, to Bush, and to Clinton, all supporting the Indonesian military. Indonesia invaded East Timor. The military was armed, trained, and financed by the United States. Ninety percent of the weapons were from the United States. In 1991, Alan Nairn and I went back to East Timor for this fact-finding mission to see what would happen. It was in late October of 91. We landed in East Timor, this tiny island 300 miles above Australia, and immediately went to the Catholic Church in Dili, the capital of East Timor. The women were wailing. We didn't know if it was the standard sorrow of East Timor or if something terrible had just happened. After the mass, we asked, and they said the Indonesian military shot into the church the night before and killed a young man named Sebastio Gomez, point-blank range. We went out on the steps, and we saw his blood on the steps of the church. The next day, a funeral was held for him, and thousands came out. They didn't know Sebastio. But this was a land where there was no freedom of speech, no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly. And the only place they could gather was in the churches. And these churches had now been violated, and the whole country mourned. We went around the country for the next two weeks asking how they would prepare for the UN delegation, how the people were preparing. And they told us everywhere the Indonesian military told them the same thing. If you speak to the delegation, we will kill your family to the seventh generation. The bishop of East Timor, Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello told us a nationwide death threat was issued. And then on November 12, 1991, two weeks after Sebastio was killed, the Timorese held a commemoration procession. They held mass at six o'clock in the morning and a thousand people came. There were so many people who came to the Motayal church, the priests had to hold the mass under the trees to give communion. And then they came out into the streets. The young people had written signs on bed sheets and they hid them in their Catholic school blouses. As they fell out into the streets and marched to the cemetery, they unfurled these banners that said things like, why the Indonesian military shoot our church? And they asked President George H.W. Bush to stop the killing. They appealed to the UN to stop the killing. We would see young women on one side of the banner in their Catholic school uniforms, and on the other side, you would see old women in their traditional Timorese garb. And they marched to the cemetery, and we followed them. 
And Alan and I were asking people, why are you risking your life? And they would say, for my mother, for my father, for my sister. For my village, it was wiped out. And then they made their way to the cemetery, the Santa Cruz Cemetery of Dili, East Timor. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. We were in the middle of the crowd. Thousands of people were in the cemetery road, and some had made it into the cemetery to pray at the graves of their loved ones. And then we saw from the, from the direction the procession had come. Hundreds of Indonesian military soldiers marching up, 10 to 12 abreast, their USM-16s at the ready position. Alan and I were standing in the middle of the crowd interviewing people, but everyone got very quiet now. And we decided to move to the front of the crowd, because although we knew the Indonesian military had committed many massacres in the past, they had never done it in front of Western journalists. Maybe just our presence could head off the attack. Now, I had always hidden my equipment when I interviewed Timorese, because if any Timorese was caught talking to a Western journalist, they could be disappeared, they could be killed. Who knew what would happen to them? But now we wanted to make it very clear who we were. I slung my tape recorder over my shoulder, I put my headphones on, and I held up my microphone like a flag. Alan put the camera above his head. Alan was writing a piece for The New Yorker at the time. I was doing a documentary for Pacifica Radio. We walked to the front of the crowd. The people got, behind us got hushed. The soldiers kept marching. They swept around the corner, and they swept past us. And without any hesitation, without any warning, without any provocation, they opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down from right to left. The first to go down behind us was a little boy, his hands with the peace sign, as they had been shouting, Viva East Timor, Viva Independence, Viva East, Viva Sebastian, exploded. A group of soldiers came at me and they grabbed my microphone, waving it in my face as if to say, this is what we don't want. And then they took their rifle butts and their boots and they beat me to the ground. Alan took a photograph of them opening fire and then threw himself on top of me to protect me from further injury. And the Indonesian soldiers use their USM-16s like baseball bats and slam them against his skull until they fractured. We were lying on the ground. Alan was covered in blood. And then a group of soldiers put the guns to our heads in firing squad fashion. And they started shouting two things, politique and Australia. Politique, they were saying that we were political to be there, to witness this. But that is our job as journalists, to go to where the silence is. And the other word, Australia, they were demanding to know if we were from Australia. And we understood how dangerous that would have been. Because 17 years before, when Indonesia invaded Australia, there were six Australian-based journalists who were covering the Indonesian invasion. Five of them were in a town called Balibo and they lined them up against a house, all the reporters, and they executed them. There was one reporter left the next day after the invasion, December 8, 1975. His name was Roger East. He got into a radio station, and he was reporting for the world what was happening. The Indonesian military grabbed him. They dragged him out of the radio station, and as he shouted, I'm from Australia, they shot him into the harbor with so many thousands of Timorese. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We believe because years later, Indonesia and Australia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing up Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. And so as we lay on the ground, Alan covered in blood, the soldiers shouting at us, Australia, we would shout back, no, America, America were from America. They had stripped us now of everything. The only thing I had left was my passport in my pocket. I pulled it out and I threw it at them. And I was born in Washington, D.C., which added further credibility. They would kick me in the stomach, but when I get my breath back, as more soldiers joined the firing line, 
I would shout back, America, America. At some point, the soldiers took the guns from our heads. We believed because we were from the same country their weapons were from. They would have to pay a price for us that they had never had to pay for killing the Timorese. And they moved on. A Red Cross jeep pulled up, and the Red Cross driver picked up an old man who had been beaten in a sewer ditch next to us. Every time he put up his hands in the prayer sign, the Indonesian soldiers took those US M16s and they would smash his face. So the driver picked up the old man, brought him into the Jeep. We climbed into it, and dozens of Timorese jumped on top of us and onto the van and uh, hanging off the tire at the back, and we drove like that as a human mass to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. Not because we were in worse shape than the Timorese. I mean, these were the lucky Timorese. These were the ones who'd been dragged from the massacre site by their brothers or their sisters. They were the ones who were not yet dead. These young people were so remarkably brave in what they did. You know, when the soldiers opened fire, if a young person had made it through the door into the cemetery. They could run as fast as they could across the cemetery and maybe escape. But if someone went down before them, they would stop. There was another reporter, um, a British videographer from Yorkshire TV, who was in the cemetery when we were in the front of the line. He didn't know what had happened when the Indonesian soldiers opened fire. He thought it was firecrackers. And then he saw the young people running past, bloody, and he started to film, and he buried his videotapes in a fresh grave. Um, he was arrested that day, rounded up. But when he got out late that night, he dug up his videotapes and had them sent to Japan and Britain, and the response was just electric. Um, that was inside the cemetery. And he filmed one scene where a young man was dragging his friend and then holding him. And he picked up his shirt, his intestines were hanging out, and he said, show this to the world, as he cradled his friend, knowing that if he'd run, he could escape, but they wouldn't leave those they cared for. And it was those people that dragged the living to the hospital. So we were not in worse shape than that. But I think the reason the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us was for two reasons. Because of what we represent. And not just me and Alan, but all of us as Americans, and not just to the people of Timor, but to people all over the world. I think we represent two things, the shield and the sword. The sword because all too often, the US uses weapons in countries like Iran, Afghanistan, or go back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Or the US arms human rights abusing regimes like they did for so many years, arm Suharto, the dictator in Indonesia. But they see the people of the United States in a very different way. You know, we can, they can't march in the streets, as you can see they're gunned down. All we have to do is call a Congress member and it can change a country's, our country's entire policy to another country. And they saw that shield blooded. That's how they see the American people, as a shield. And it just deepened their despair. We left the hospital. I was quite sure the Indonesian military would raid the hospital. It's where the survivors were. We went into hiding. We made it to the bishop's house, Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello, who would later win the Nobel Peace Prize. And there were thousands taking refuge on his grounds. And Bishop Bello helped me clean up out. Um, his skull was fractured. It was like a bathing cap of blood under his dark hair. And Alan's shirt was covered in blood. So we removed his shirt. Bishop Bello gave him a new shirt. And I took his shirt and I wrapped it around my waist under a towel because I knew the Indonesian military would deny that anything had happened to the Timorese. But if they did, at least explain what happened to us. So the whole country was shut down now. I mean, the whole city at this point. 
and the trucks were rolling through the streets of Dili with soldiers. We could hear continued gunfire in different parts of Dili. But we knew that we hadn't succeeded in stopping the killing on that day. The Indonesian military killed more than 270 people on that day. That if we could get out of the country, it would only be outside pressure that would stop the slaughter. So we had to make it to the airport. There was one plane out that day. If an Indonesian cab driver picked us up, we would never make it. If it was a Timorese driver, we possibly had a chance. We went out into the street, we found a driver, and we made our way to the airport. At the airport, total military occupied airport, we went up to the counter. We demanded to be able to get on the plane. First they were screaming, security, security. We don't know if they had already decided they weren't going to kill us, so they wanted us out. Or if there was a gap in communication between How injured he was. And so I would stop every few minutes as we walked to the tarmac and say, I must stop, take pause, and look at this beautiful country. The soldiers would hurry us along, and I would say, just wait. And then as Alan would come up to me, we would walk again, and then I would stop. We got into the plane, and as the plane door closed, the flight attendants gave me a silver bowl with water in it, and they said, clean him. We flew from East Timor to West Timor, which is a part of Indonesia, and then on to Bali. And there we made the call to the West, and we said a massacre has taken place. Alan had the phone at his head. We were trying to get on a plane from Bali, considered a paradise on Earth, but in fact, heavily surveilled. Many people were killed there. Um, and as Alan was telling reporters in the United States about what had happened, I was cleaning the blood off the phone with that towel that I had wrapped around my waist. We got on the plane, a continental flight in Bali, and when they closed the doors of the plane, the flight attendants there called the naval doctors. We were flying on to Guam, and many were taking vacation in Bali. And they announced on the loudspeaker, we need doctors. And they were taking care of Alan as we made our way to Guam. On Guam, though, we would not go to the Naval Hospital because they knew they would cut off access to us. And we felt it was critical to get word out. Time was of the essence. So we went to Guam Memorial Hospital. An ambulance met us and took us to the hospital. Every single switchboard line was filled with the New York Times, with the Washington Post, with the BBC, with all of the networks, with Portuguese and Australian press, all over the world. And even as Alan was being operated on, as they were sewing up his head, he would not stop telling the story. Occasionally he would scream into the phone, but he kept repeating it. And we were on different lines and we kept telling the story. And then we were brought by ambulance to a cable studio linked up with CNN. And when we were in hiding, because they'd stripped us of everything, and I knew the military would deny anything happened, we got someone to take 18 pictures of us. And I hid the film. And so on Guam, we had that film developed. And in the cable studio, as we went on CNN, we showed the images. And we describe what happened. The Indonesian military surrounded the area without hesitation, without provocation, without warning. They opened fire on this defenseless people. And this was not one of the worst massacres in East Timor. We got back to the United States, held a news conference in the National Press Club, getting Alan out of the hospital to do this as soon as we returned, and said that the Indonesian military used U.S. weapons. A nationwide movement grew up in this country as people heard about the massacre spearheaded by the East Timor Action Network that just was born. And Congress members got more calls in this span of years on Timor than on any other foreign policy issue they would tell us. In, 1990, in 1993, well, we were banned then from returning to Indonesia or Timor because it was occupied. 
by the Indonesian military. But in 93, Clinton, President Clinton, was going to Jakarta for the APEC summit, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. And to show that the Indonesian military had changed, the Jakarta Post put a big headline on their front page, Goodman and Nairn allowed in the country. So we flew to Jakarta immediately. It was the third anniversary of the massacre in Timor, so we tried to get into East Timor and we were arrested. But because it was causing an international response and Clinton was flying in, they had to release us, holding us on a military base. Then in 1999, the people of East Timor got to vote for their freedom in a UN-sponsored UN resolution. I attempted to cover this vote. I flew into Jakarta and I was captured by the military. They deported me. And so the next day I got into Bali, but they caught me again and they deported me. Um, but Alan did get in. The Timorese, even old women who were in hospital taken by gurney to the polling place, almost every Timorese voted and overwhelmingly voted for their freedom. And as they did this, and Alan's reports are remarkable, the last Western journalist in Timor until he was arrested and taken into Indonesia by the military. As the people of East Timor voted for their freedom, the Indonesian military in a sadistic goodbye operation burned East Timor to the ground. More than a thousand more Timorese they killed. For the next three years, the UN ran East Timor. And then on May 20th, and this is where I'll end, on May 20th, 2002, the people of East Timor celebrated their independence. They became the newest nation in the world. I was able to get into East Timor that day, going through Australia. It was no longer occupied, and Alan got in as well. And we went to Tasitolo, a sandy plain just outside of Dillon where 100,000 Timorese gathered. And this was an international event. It was just about midnight, and then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan gave an address. And then Shanana Bushma, the rebel leader of East Timor, long imprisoned by the Indonesian military, got up on the podium. He was the founding president of East Timor. He gave an address in four languages, and then he unfurled the flag of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. There was this fireworks display, and you could see the light reflected in the tear-stained faces of the people of East Timor. They had resisted, and they had won. At an unbelievably high price, at an unacceptably high price, a third of their population slaughtered, one of the worst genocides of the 20th century. But this nation of survivors had prevailed. And they thanked people all over the world, especially from the most powerful Western nations, who had told their governments to stop supplying human rights abusing regimes with weapons. And it is a lesson to all of us, whether we are journalists, or scientists, whether we are doctors, nurses, business people, whether we are artists, whether we are employed or unemployed, we have a decision to make every day, every hour of every day, and that is whether to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy Now!